Thank you, Brian. It is always such a pleasure uh, to be here, to be standing before you, to see all your faces again. Um, I can't express to you how much love I have in my heart for this church. Uh, and I, I want to thank you so much for all that you've done for me and for Bailey over the last couple of years in our work in Wallingford. As you know, we're about to move. Um, if you don't, you do now. Uh, we're about to move, and um, we've just been reflecting on our time in Wallingford. Uh, we've reached out to many people. I've had a number of studies. A lot of people have heard the gospel, uh, and we have had some people uh, who have uh, become regular members, who have um, dedicated themselves to God or more fully to God. In the meantime, there's been a lot of good work done there. And we could not have done it without you, without your prayers, without your financial support. Um, and so I want to thank you all so much for that. Uh, in my time there, uh, although there, were, there, have, there are many good memories, there have been a lot of difficulties there as well. Uh, when I moved there within about two months, uh, I ended up preaching a funeral for the mother of one of our members. A couple months after that, uh, one of our members was diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. Later that same year, uh, uh, the son of one of our members suddenly passed away. Uh, and so there's been a lot of trying to understand suffering, affliction, trials, tribulations, but as well as understanding comfort uh, and where to find comfort and how we comfort people. So this has been on my mind lately, and as Tom mentioned in his prayer, the reason I'm out here is because my grandmother, my mother's mother, recently and suddenly died. And so this has been back on my mind, this issue, this issue of comfort. How do we comfort people? Where do we find comfort? And the Bible has a lot to say about this. Now, the issue of suffering itself is one that bothers many people. Uh, it's what I like to call a person's trump card. As if they say the issue of suffering is the reason why I don't believe in God. In fact, Bart Ehrman, who some of you may know is one of the most prominent New Testament scholars of our time, I once heard in an interview, he was asked why he's an atheist. And his response is because of the issue of suffering. That was his response. And so this isn't, however, just an issue for atheists and agnostics. It's an issue for many Christians. There are many who lose their faith over suffering, over difficulties. So it's one that we cannot ignore. It's one we have to address. And the truth is, the Bible does address it many times. In fact, I put together a study once on the issue of suffering, and I found 17 unique reasons for suffering mentioned in the Bible. So the Bible has a lot to say about why people suffer, but the Bible doesn't just end there. The Bible also talks about how to deal with it. And I think this goes really unnoticed, that not only does the Bible explain reasons for suffering in this world, but it also gives us the answer for how to deal with it. And you'd think that this just goes totally ignored by people, that if the Bible gives you the reason and gives you the answer, you would at least try it to see if it works. And unfortunately, many people don't. They don't try it to at least see if there's an answer to be found here. Now, this passage here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1 uh, doesn't go nowhere. It actually continues in verses 8 through 11, where Paul deals with the afflictions he experienced in Asia. In fact, there are a number of passages in 2 Corinthians dealing with affliction and and comfort. Paul will later talk about the previous letter he had written, uh, and he, he, he discusses the affliction and the comfort and how there's no one there to comfort him if he comes. Uh, and he, so affliction and comfort begins the epistle and really continues throughout much of it as well. Uh, but I want us to focus on comfort and affliction with a huge emphasis on comfort, what comfort is. And I want us to take a moment and remember that the Bible is a translated word. That we're dealing with an idea that the translators have said this is best translated as the word comfort. 
And with simple ideas, that's very easy to do, like a dog. You can translate dog from one language to another, no problem. But you start getting into things, I mean, even like the word soup, for example. You know, in Japanese, you don't eat soup, you drink it. That's the verb you use to talk about soup. So even there, you start to get a, a little different, let alone comfort, and how we deal with comfort. And I would like you to take a moment and try to totally disassociate everything you know about comfort and go into this blind and say, what is Paul describing? This thing he is calling comfort, what is it? What is he describing and what role does it play in our lives? I'm just going to give you a huge spoiler here and tell you what it is. Uh, and then we're going to go through this passage. I'll try to reemphasize it throughout. That comfort is helping someone endure a trial so that they come out a Christian on the other side. I'm going to say that again. Comfort is helping someone endure a trial or an affliction. So that they come out a Christian on the other side. That's comfort. That is New Testament comfort. So we're going to start looking at these verses. And I'd like to look at verses 3 and 4 of 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 starting in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. I know that's, that's a hard sentence to get through and to follow all of Paul's stop signs, uh, but I hope by the end of this lesson you'll have a better understanding of how to read this. Um, but I, I first want us to talk about what comfort is not. Because sometimes it's better to start with something is not before you get into what it is. First of all, comfort is not being comfortable. And this is a big mistake we make when we try to comfort people. We think when I want to comfort someone, my role is to make you comfortable. Now, I don't, I don't, I don't want to come across wrongly here. There are times where that's true. However, if someone is, for example, in extreme pain, it is possible to comfort them without the pain ever going away. Comfort is not just or not limited to the act of making someone comfortable. But that's what we want to do. When we see someone who is suffering, whether it's the death of a loved one, whether it's chronic pain, whether it's someone who lost their job and they're trying to find their way, whatever it is, we want to take them out of the situation. And we think this is how we resolve this. This is how we make, this is how we comfort them. We take them out of it. When really, you read this and you look at Jesus, for example, going to the cross. They weren't taken out of it. They were taught how to endure it. And to come out the other side still a Christian. So comfort is not limited to making people comfortable. And we really confuse the two sometimes. Paul, Paul taught us to weep with those who weep. Not to take someone who's weeping out of their sorrow, but to go into their sorrow and help them endure it. You weep with those who weep. It's very, we, we understand rejoicing with the, those who are rejoicing. We get that. But the problem is when someone's weeping, we also want to make them someone who's rejoicing. And rarely, if ever, do we go the other way. Do we take someone who's rejoicing and say, like, no, you need to be weeping. <laughs> we're really one-sided. We're, we're one-directional in this. We are to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice. We are to go to where they are and help them endure it and to come out the other side with their faith in God still intact. 
So comfort is not limited to being comfortable. That, that's the first huge takeaway. Comfort, what it is not. It is not being comfortable. It's not the same thing. And second, it's not something you do on your own. If you find someone who is in various trials or afflictions, whatever it is, and you think, I'm going to go to them on my own, you're already off to the wrong start. I mean, read these verses again, verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. Right? That, that is a, a direction of God comforting us so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. So we take the same comfort and pass it along with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. It's not something you do on your own. And if you try to do it on your own, you're already off to the wrong start. Actually, the way you start comforting someone else is by keeping in mind all the ways God has comforted you in, in your afflictions. That's where you start. You start with, how has God comforted me? What has God done for me? And then you move on. This, this is God giving you life experience so that you can take that same experience and, and Pass it along to someone else. So what comfort is not, first of all, it's not being comfortable. It's not the same thing. And second, it's not something we do on our own. We draw on our experiences of when God has comforted us so that we can in turn go and comfort other people. So those are the two things comfort really is not. Now we need to ask, well, what is it? And I want to give you two concepts and then two actions. The first concept of what comfort is, is whatever it is, God is worthy of worship for it. Look at verse 3 here. Paul says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know what it means to bless God? Because it's not the same as God blessing us. When we think of God blessing us, we think of God giving us things. Uh, you know, whether they're, they're spiritual, uh, you know, disciplines of some kind. Uh, whether they're, they're uh, you know, fruit of the spirit of some kind. Or maybe they are physical blessings. We think of God giving us things. But that's not what it is to bless God. Whenever you read someone blessing God in the Old Testament, it happens a ton, especially in the Psalms, or in the New Testament, it is an act of worship. It is an act of honor. Blessed be God. And Paul says, blessed be God, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Whatever comfort is, before we even get into actions, we need to understand this is something so good, so valuable, that God is worthy of worship for it. I mean, just take a moment and believe that. This means that if someone gives you the option, of either owning all the stock in Apple or Amazon or something, or being comforted by someone, comfort is more valuable. It really, not just in a theoretical way, it really is. It is so valuable that God is worthy of worship for it. We should really think about that the next time uh, we may be thinking of you know, writing someone a card. Or putting our arms around someone who's suffering. That is so good and so valuable that when God does it, he's worthy of worship for it. That's how good it is to comfort someone. So before we get into actions, you have to understand how valuable it is. Because one of our problems is our value system is totally out of order. We value things like money over an ability to comfort someone. And that's totally backwards. 
So whatever comfort is, is, God is worthy of worship for it. And whatever comfort is, this is the second concept I want to give you, it originates in God, not in you. It comes from God. Once again, let's read this sentence. I know it's a hard sentence, but let's reread it. Verses 3 and 4. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. So when you go to comfort someone, you start with, what is the comfort God has given to me? Because comfort originates in God. It comes from God. And we cannot do it on our own. And if we try to do it on our own, like I said, we're, we're really off to the wrong start. Now, God, uh, comfort originates in God, but God comforts us for a reason. Paul gives us the reason, right? This, this is one of those times where you have to realize the Bible says suffering is not meaningless. There's purpose and intention behind it. In verse 4, who comforts us in all our affliction, why? So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. One of the reasons God comforts us is so we can comfort others. And by the way, I hope you caught in verse 4 that God comforts us in all our afflictions so that we can comfort those who are in any affliction. Let's say this another way. Comfort is not specific to experience. I don't have to have lost a child in order to comfort someone who has lost a child. Now, if I have gone through that, I may be able to a deeper degree comfort them. But the question isn't, have I lost a child? The question is, has God ever comforted me? You don't have to have gone through the same thing in order to provide at least a little bit of comfort. And that's one of our excuses often, isn't it? When we're really honest with ourselves. We often say, well, I, I may just make it worse. And you know what? You might. But you'll learn from it. God comforts us in our affliction, whatever that is, so that we can comfort those who are in any affliction. It doesn't have to be the same one. The question isn't, have you gone through the same thing? The question is, have you ever been comforted? Because if you have, you are at least qualified to give a little bit of comfort. Comfort originates in God, and God comforts us for a reason, so that we can in turn comfort other people. Now I said I want to give you two concepts and two actions. The first concept being that God is worthy of worship for it. The second being it originates in God. But now I want to give you two actions associated with comfort. The first is that comfort is an act of mercy. You read this verse here in verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort. Now, you can disagree with this. I, I'm not bothered. I think what Paul is doing here is something where you, where you often see in the Bible where something similar is stated twice, just in a slightly different way. I don't think God being the Father of mercy and God being the God of all comfort is necessarily two different things. Because isn't comforting someone an act of mercy? Isn't it really kind of having pity on someone and what they're going through? In fact, people who are unmerciful are often people who don't give comfort to anyone. It's really an act of mercy. It's understanding this is hard for them to go through, even if it wouldn't be hard for you to go through. 
You're being merciful toward them, toward their circumstances, toward their situations. And you go into those circumstances and help them to come out the other side with their faith still intact. So the first action, comfort is an act of mercy. The second action is that it's an act of encouragement. In fact, this word that we translate as comfort is periclesis. It's often translated as encouragement. Because that's what comfort does to us, doesn't it? It encourages us. But here's the thing about encouragement. Encouragement is pointing you in a direction to keep going in that direction, isn't it? Because comfort is helping someone endure a trial or affliction... And to go in the direction that they have to go to sometimes walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but to come out the other side still a Christian. It's directional. Like I said, there are two concepts and two actions I want you to understand about comfort. The two concepts that God is worthy of worship for it, and the second that it originates in God. And the two actions, that it's an act of mercy as well as an act of encouragement. But you've got to have the end goal in mind. Because if you don't have the end goal in mind, you don't know why you're encouraging someone. You don't know the direction you're trying to help them go in. We comfort people so that they don't lose faith in God during their trials and afflictions. So that by the end, they still trust God. Now that's verses 3 and 4. Dealing with what is comfort? How does Paul understand it? How is he explaining it? I now want us to get into verses 5 through 7. And I want us to understand that comfort and affliction is something shared. It is a shared experience. Starting in verse 5. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Comfort and affliction is something we share. Which means it's not just about us. It's not just about me and what I'm going through. Because when we go through trials, tribulations, various kinds, we often think this is... This is my suffering. I own it. It's mine. It belongs to me. And it doesn't. The church shares in it. Or we, we go the other way. And we say that's, that's your suffering. That's your trial. That's your affliction. I'll just give you room. But it, it's not just theirs. It's ours too. It's our trials. It's our sufferings. It's our afflictions. You weep with those who weep. While they're weeping. You don't wait for them to get better to feel sad about it. You weep with them while they're weeping. It's a shared experience. And it's shared by a couple uh, different people in this passage here. The first of all, uh, it's shared by Christ. To enter into trials and afflictions and suffering is to enter into a path that Christ has already walked. That he has already gone through. And in fact, he's currently going through it because he's going through it with you. It's something that is shared by Christ. You, you have this in verse 5. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings... So through Christ, we share abundantly in comfort, too. 
I want you to take a moment and run through what are the afflictions and the sufferings of Christ? What did he endure in this world? I mean, he endured things like being mocked, even though he was right. Even from a very early age, we go through that, don't we? He went through physical pain. He went through, as Brent discussed this morning, being made sin before the Father. Christ went through a number of afflictions. He was, he was disowned by, by family and friends. But you don't just share in Christ's afflictions, you share in Christ's comfort too. Well, Christ was comforted, wasn't he? Maybe he was, he was disowned by friends and family, but uh, he, he gained the church. He gained new friends and new family. Maybe Christ was mocked, even though he was right, but he was also raised and glorified. And this is something we share in. We share in Christ's comforts. You know, Paul teaches us that, that we will also one day be glorified. All the times pe people have mocked us and told us we were wrong even though we're right. One day we will be glorified with him because he will return and we will be made as he is. Afflictions and comfort are shared experiences. And they're first shared by Christ. Now I want you to notice what Christ's comfort was not. It was not being taken out of the situation. It was not that the pain it just stopped. He saw it through into the end. He was comforted. Remember, he was comforted by angels. But what did the angels help him do? They helped him go to the cross and to come out the other side with his faith in God still intact. We share in Christ's afflictions and we share in his comfort. Because comfort and affliction are shared. And they're first and foremost shared by Christ. But they're also shared by other Christians. Look at verses 6 and 7. If we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. You, you have two groups of people there. You have Paul and whoever else he's included in that. And you have the, the saints in Corinth. If we are afflicted, that is Paul and his companions, it is for your comfort and salvation. The saints in Corinth. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort which you experience when you patiently endure the same sufferings that we suffer. Paul shared in their comfort and affliction, and they shared in Paul's. And the same is true of us today. We still share in one another's comforts and afflictions. You know, in the New Testament, the church is often compared to a body. And when a body is healthy, the whole body reacts when the toe hurts, right? The whole body reacts when the arm is hurt. The whole body reacts when something happens to the eyes or the ears or the nose, when the body is healthy. But there's something wrong with the body when nothing happens to me even though my toe hurts, even though my eyes hurt. We share in comfort and affliction. It is first and foremost shared by Christ, but it is shared also by other Christians. And this requires us to go outside our zone of, of where things are Normal and easy. I wasn't going to say comfort zone, but I don't want to confuse you when I'm trying to redefine comfort. We, you've got to go outside of what is normal, what is easy, what is routine. And that goes both ways. When someone is suffering, you go into their world even though it's uncomfortable. 
and you comfort them. But it goes the other way too. When you're suffering and you're going through trials and afflictions, you go outside what is normal and easy and routine and you let others into your life to comfort you. Because we share in it. Comfort and affliction is something we share. There's one last thing I'd like to point out here. And maybe you noticed it in verse 6. I, find, I found it very odd. And it stood out to me. Paul writes, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. Isn't that odd? We've had a number of things thrown into this passage that, that we don't normally associate with comfort. Things like blessing and worship. Things like mercy. Things like encouragement. Now all of a sudden, you've got to deal with salvation thrown into this. I want you, I'm going to tell you what I think this passage is. What this means. You can try it on. Uh, see if it fits. I think this comes from two places. One, we share in comfort and self. We share in affliction. So when someone in the church hurts, I hurt. When someone in the church suffers, I suffer. I can't help but suffer. So they are sharing in Paul's afflictions. But secondly, the New Testament is very consistent in teaching that trials and afflictions refine us unto salvation. So when you go through an affliction, I go through it too, and therefore it refines even me unto salvation. I mean, isn't that true? Isn't that, isn't that what we see here? If, if it's true that when you suffer, I suffer, and if it's true that suffering refines us unto salvation, then it is also true that your suffering refines even me. And the New Testament is very consistent in this. Old Testament as well. You know, you, you refine gold in the fire to clear it of the dross. And suffering and trials refines us. It purifies us of sin. And that's one of the reasons why we have to be very careful not to find comfort in sin while we're suffering. That's, that's one of the first places we go, isn't it? When we're suffering, we go, we go right into our, our routines, our temptations, the things that comfort us. When the whole point of, of suffering and trials is that it refines us of sin in our lives. Going to sin to be comforted is the exact opposite of what we should be doing. In order to understand suffering, you have to understand God's view of the eternal. This is why people can't make sense of suffering. Because they assume that you live and you die and you go to the ground and that's it. And if that's true, then I agree. God is cruel. Why would I just suffer and die and go to the ground and that would be the end of me? But if there is an existence beyond here... If you are, in fact, an eternal creature, suffering refines you for something noble, for something good. And even suffering and trials can be blessings in our lives in the long run. But you have to understand it from the eternal perspective. Because if you lose sight of the eternal, you lose it all. Paul here connects suffering with salvation, and I hope I've explained what I have in mind. Uh, and like I said, you can try that on, see if it fits. But that's how I understand this passage. That it's not just my trials that refine me, it's your trials. Because in your trials, I suffer too. And in your trials, I learn how to be someone who comforts people. I learn, I learn a quality of God which is comforting others. That's an amazing thing, to learn how to become like God. 
to take on God-oriented attributes. We share in suffering and affliction. No one goes through it alone. No one is on their own when they're in the church. Because the church goes through it with you. And comforting someone is not just making someone comfortable, although at times it can be that. But it is much bigger in scope. It is helping someone get through their trial and affliction and come out the other side with their faith still intact. To come out the other side still a Christian. Affliction is not far from any of us. For some, it may already be here. For some of you, you may have gone through it already, and it may be just around the corner as well. If you live long enough, you will face severe trials and afflictions in your life. There is no getting around it. But comfort is here too. In fact, comfort has been a part of earth for longer than affliction has. Affliction doesn't even come in until Genesis 3. Comfort's been there for Genesis 1 and 2. Because God's been there for Genesis 1 and 2. And after this age is over, comfort will continue. And uh, I'm counting on living in a world where there is no more sin and there is no more affliction. But we can't lose sight of the eternal perspective. If you're here this evening and you are in need of comfort, please invite people into your life. That's one of the purposes of the church. To comfort people, to pray for people, to be a part of this so you don't have to go through it alone. If you're not in an affliction right now, maybe you could look for those who are and see how you can comfort them. Understanding that your role is to be one that is merciful, one that is encouraging, one that helps them get through their trial with their faith still intact. If you're here this evening and you need prayers, if you're here this evening and you'd like to be baptized, if there's anything that we can do for you, please make your need known now as we stand and sing the invitation song.